All right. Tonight we're going to talk about the a few of the contract addenda that many of you um, ask questions about. Go into more detail in in terms of the 22D, uh, the 22K, the 22T, and the 22 um, EF. You know that's a a form that I'm seeing a lot more that's being used, and I think a lot of you are not understanding a lot of terms on 22 EF. So we're going to spend some time going over those addenda. If you can see them on the screen on line 16, you'll see that they're listed there, and we're going to go into detail specifically on 22D, 22 EF, 22K, and 22T if you just joined us. Um, and so they do need to be listed if you're going to use them on line number 16. So if you are new to the business and you're wondering, well, what's line 16 for? You will probably have to memorize these things. If you're a new broker, I used to use flashcards when I left the state of Washington and was working in another state. This is unique to Washington. Other states actually have um, the addenda built into their main purchase and sale agreement. They don't have to pick and choose. Uh, sometimes they, in other states you actually have the ability to add addenda, um, but use the clauses and build them into the contract. So you will have to memorize these numbers and these forms so that you know what to grab when and what you need to use them for. So uh, tonight we'll go over a bit more detail so that you know what, why you should use um, a certain addenda or what you should be concerned about when filling them in. So let's go to the next uh, 22D, Shannon, if you could slip on through. Um, if you do have questions throughout the presentation tonight, if you'd like to send um, a message, that is fine. We will take questions at the end. Um, and if you have a, a specific question that I may not cover tonight, and it's definitely contract related, uh, go ahead and send me an email tonight, uh, or you can give me a call or shoot me a text. I am working late on Monday nights to make sure that you guys are trained and you have the tools necessary to be successful. So uh, don't be a stranger, and if I, you can't reach me, I've got a great backup, uh, Jerry Kay, who can answer most of the contract questions as well. Um, so we're looking at 22D here, and this is, um, this is actually a mock contract that we did in class last Friday, and we didn't have time to go through the specifics, but the agent actually was trained right by their Keller Williams broker. So. Um, there's only a couple things that we'll go over that you know maybe need to be a consideration uh, from those of you who are joining us. Number one, if you are not using 22D and you, or maybe you thought, well, why do I have to use 22D? The reason we put 22D and require it in all of our contracts is because of term number one. There have been past incidents, not at my firm, not at Best Choice Realty, but in past firms and in some of my competitors where they've had lawsuits they've had to deal with because the seller closes the file or the buyer closes the file and then they sue the brokerage or the broker for making representations in terms of the lot size or the square footage of the property. Maybe there was a, a fence put on the property and, and then that included additional square footage that was not disclosed. Those types of incidents happen, and so by including 22D, what we're doing is adding some additional protection for you and for the firm so that we're not making representations in terms of the lot size or the square footage or potential encroachments. Those are really, really um, frustrating things for buyers or sellers to encounter after the close of escrow. So if you have been writing contracts without 22D, shame on you because you're missing that protection, uh, number one, and then number two, also on title insurance. Um, there is already built into the contract um, in line 11 through 13, an ALTA policy. And so many of you, um, I don't know if it's just misinterpreting what line, what two is, but you end up thinking, well, I'm just going to check the box on standard, or you want, I want more coverage because my attorney has told me I want extended. There's very rare times you're going to need extended, but if you have a question about that, you may want to reach out and talk to me or to Jerry Kay, and we can involve our attorney in determining whether the property is suited for extended coverage. Sometimes it makes sense. Other times what attorneys are asking for when they ask for their, they do a review of the contract with their clients, they're wanting that all to form a policy, which is described in section 11 through 13. So again, if you're not using um, 
term, you know, 22D or including 22D, then what you're going to get when you get your title policy is just a regular standard policy. And that's a seller's cost at seller's expense. But this section in 22D term two allows for um, if we need to downgrade and go back to standard or if we need to upgrade and go to extended, but you're automatically by using 22D, you're instructing escrow to apply for an Ulta form of policy. If you have a client where like, oh, it's a new construction or, oh, it's um, a foreclosure or a short sale or something like that, you still may want to get the Alta policy and there might be some language that says that you're not going to get it in the foreclosure documents. By including 22D and then stipulating in, in the other section that the buyer is going to pay for that extended policy or that Alta policy, that would be something to, to um, offer. You know, and sometimes it's only a few hundred dollars. Um, one time I was doing a deal and I was, it was a very complicated where the seller was being really, really picky and not wanting to pay the extra, I think it was $325 for the Alta policy. But it was definitely protection for the buyer because the buyer was wanting to have, um, they wanted to have some, in case there was encroachments, in case there was things that had happened to the property when the transfer of ownership happened, they wanted protection and that Alta policy would have protected them um, the standard would not, and so they wanted to do that, even though the client, the seller was going through kind of some hard times, a short sale, and they didn't have the ability to come up with the 300 and some dollars. The buyer opted to pay for that additional policy. We wrote that in, instructed escrow, and everybody was happy, and there was a claim. Um, and so it was a definitely a win-win for, for my client and for me because I knew how to explain Ulta versus standard versus extended. Um, number three and number four, that we like to have checked. That gives us additional protection when we're representing the buyer to make sure that the removal of the trash and the debris and the rubbish is taken off the property before the taking possession. Here's the problem I see with checking boxes three and four, you guys, is that you often will check the box three and four, but you won't enforce it. And you once it closes, once the deal has funded and recorded, you, you can't hold them accountable to three and four. It's extremely difficult. And that's when sometimes I have to get involved or I have to call the designated broker. and We have to hope to goodness that the designated broker on the other side is willing to, you know, put their, you know, go by the contract and, and not have a, a dam you know, damage their reputation. But, you know, there's not a lot of skin on this after you get recording or you guys have already signed papers. So before you sign papers, I want to remind you, if you've checked box three and four, you might want to do a walkthrough and make sure that, you know, you can enforce this part three and four because it becomes extremely challenging after you sign your papers or after your buyer signs their papers to then say, oh, but what about all that trash in the garage? Are they going to take that? Because they bought... You check box four, so any personal property remaining on the property, we might have a debate between whether a refrigerator that's not working or you know the freezer part's working, but the refrigerator's not working, is that trash or is that personal property? I mean, then we have a debate like that. So if you are dealing with something, multiple offer, you may want to not have box three and four checked. That would be as is. Um, if you want to check three and four, just make sure you need you do a walk through uh, to make sure that you can enforce part three and four. Now, number five, um, a lot of you have failed to check the box, or you've checked maybe the sewer and the uh, public water main, but you failed to check the box next to number five. In order for it to be part of the addenda, you have to check like. Um, like we did here, number five, the box is checked. This is done properly, but sometimes you guys are, are hurrying through and not checking the appropriate boxes. This is a circuit breaker to make sure that if the seller represents that the property is connected to the sewer main and to the electrical. So here's what could happen if you're a listing agent and you make a mistake. This could be a big mistake that could cost you a lot of headache. Um, luckily, we've caught most of these that have happened, but you know, you check the box, your seller represents that the property is connected to the sewer main, and we find out in the middle of the transaction that it actually is connected to the septic system. Then you'll need to go in and amend this, either with an addendum or amend this section, because that's not proper disclosure by the seller. And so your listing agent is on the hook for this. It's part of the contract, and it says to the best of the seller's knowledge, the seller represents the property is connected, 
And then a buyer's agent is going in and filling this in, typically. Using the MLS sheet, they're in a, indicating what date, to their best of knowledge, how it should be filled in. So if you see as a listing agent that this is not done properly or they check the wrong box, it's connected to natural gas but it actually is only electricity, or they've got some sort of propane tank or something like that that's connected in the other, you'll want to go in and make that adjustment and counter them and make sure that the parties are aware of what transfers when, when the property closes. Number six is not common. I don't see that done a lot. Number seven, um, if you're dealing with property uh, propane tanks and security systems, you definitely want to address that in Section 7. That also provides a contingency. So if there is a contingency necessary to make sure things are done properly with a lease, it's not common, but sometimes in our outline areas we deal with propane tanks or security systems or things that transfer title like hot water tanks. There was a water heater um, last month that we dealt with that was leased and the parties were not aware of that. And so we ended up having to split that between the brokers because the seller and buyer were just getting into a big fight over it. And so to solve it, we ended up doing a contribution from Best Choice Realty and then I think it was John L. Scott ended up contributing for the water heater lease and paying that entire lease off. The lease on the water heater was I think a few thousand dollars, so it's not cheap. And if you miss number seven or you're not aware of what's leased and what's not leased on the property, that could get yourself, get yourself into trouble. Number eight, you use it as a contingency if you have an HOA. So if you're dealing with a condo, this would be a place where you could actually ask for some more items. This is something where you would have to provide more items if box eight was checked, such as rules and regulations or minutes of the meetings or financial statements or operating budget. If this is box is checked, you know, you're allowed to, you're allowed to g obtain this information from the seller. A lot of times buyers are not getting this, and again, if the timeline's passed, then that means it's waived, so be careful on that. Um, number nine, uh, we have had some confusion on number nine. You check the box on number nine, and then you say, seller, if not filled in, well, if you got to read the little section. It says, if the association documents do not provide which party pays. So that doesn't mean that the seller is going to pay. A lot of you guys don't read what you're having your sellers or your buyers sign, but if the association documents say that the buyer pays the fee and the seller is checked, then the buyer is paying. That's, it, it starts with whatever the HOA documents or association documents are structured but it reverts to this if the HOA documents don't state. Number 10, if, they, if the agent in the listing, in this particular listing, actually said the tag plants go with the seller, this was, we had four people in class on Friday and only one of the four people actually wrote. Um, so good job, Stephen. He actually um, read the agent only remarks and then went ahead in the uh, mock contract and checked box 10 and that's exactly what you want to do is you want to provide more clarity um, so the parties are aware what's excluded from the property. I love how you put C exhibit B, there probably is some sort of drawing of what tag plants are going in the front yard. Number 11, I've been counseling people for the last four years to go ahead, every buyer and seller needs to be made aware of the home warranty plans that are available that may give additional protection. Um, this is good protection for you as a buyer. After the deal closes, I've had buyers or sellers call me and say, well, my, my agent said they were going to get me a home warranty and they didn't give me a home warranty. And clearly I can revert and show them the contract that says, and I encourage you to check box number 11, and in the section D and the other, just write buyer chooses no home warranty. You can go ahead and write that in that open space, or you can indicate what home warranty provider you're going to provide, who's going to pay. You could write that in the other section. Um, but number 11 is a great place to put in information about who is paying for home warranty and what home warranty provider, or plain and simple, that they've been made aware of the home warranty plans and ch are choosing not to have a home warranty. That's where that other section would get written in. That means up until the day of closing, they can, you guys can change your mind and then escrow can go ahead and put the home warranty on, but this is in the contract. This is a nice, simple way to acknowledge that they have been made aware, um, but they're choosing no home warranty. So you can go ahead and include number 11. It doesn't hurt anybody to write that layer of disclosure. Number 12, they left it purposely small, so you're not typing a ton of information. 
If you're buying your own property or you're part of an LLC, disclosure is required. If there's a relationship to the parties, that also needs to be disclosed in Section 12. Um, if you are offering credits or you're doing that type of work, be very careful not to put it in Section 12. Um, that might be better suited on an addendum on a Form 34 um, negotiated and signed by, by the parties. Um, but 12 sometimes get overlooked, um, so be very careful if you're representing the seller and there's something written into Section 12, that does become part of the contract. It's no different than if it was on a Form 34. Um, we had an agent who had not realized that closing costs were written into Section 12, and that was a hard pill to swallow when we realized after people had got mutual that there was a $5,000 contribution by seller to buyer for closing costs written into Section 12, and that is part of the contract, and that was something that had to be, there was nothing, we couldn't go back on our word on number 12, so be careful on 12. That will sometimes put, um, it's an area of risk, something that I look and oversee, um, and I would assume that the parties are aware of that because they've initialed right, a, you know, right below that statement. Let's go to the next form, Shannon, on FERPTA. I want to remind you on FERPTA 22E, that is not part of the contract. In fact, they used to have it as a drop-down menu on page one, and they've, oh God, about a year ago, they went ahead and removed 22E from the drop-down because people were making it part of the contract. It is a disclosure piece. It is a page that is required uh, to be disclosed by the seller. This would be a great piece to add to your listing presentation and make sure your seller has provided this along with their Form 17 and indicated in their citizenship status whether they are or are not a foreign citizen. So go ahead and have them do that. A 22E is only to be filled out by the buyer or signed by the buyer if this foreign, if it, they are not a U.S. citizen. Um, it is not required for this buyer to sign. And so I wouldn't confuse matters by including this um, unless the seller has not provided one or provided some sort of insight whether their client is a, um, you, you know, if it's a su supplement in the f next to the Form 17, then that's fine. Um, indicate on the purchase and sale agreement that they are not a foreign citizen if you're a buyer's agent, and there's no need to include this disclosure. That's, that's again, a disclosure, not a contract item. Let's keep going, Shannon. Uh, evidence of funds. I think I have time to cover this tonight. Um, evidence of funds is a form, again, just like we talked about, it is part of the contract because it's one of the drop-down items but it is not meant to be a contingency. So it is confusing because they use the words non-contingent funds. This is a form that can be used if you are a listing agent and you are wanting to verify uh, the funds that are maybe spelled out in the 22A. You can use a 22EF as well as a 22A. So that's a um, kind of a misinterpreted thing by a lot of brokers out there. They don't understand what a 22EF is for. It is a verification of funds addendum, and it is an addendum that's part of the purchase and sale agreement, unlike the 22E. Evidence can be, you know, funds from, you know, a U.S. bank account, non-contingent funds. Again, that's what's referenced. If this was the form and Stephen was writing this contract and he checked box two and also included a 22A, this form could be used to disclose funds and non-contingent funds would be the way to do that. So if you wanted to counter, say that the client, you were a listing agent and the 22A said they were putting 50% down and you are wanting to verify that those 50, that 50% 50 down funds is going to be um, you know, that it's in the in the client's bank account. It's not coming from another source or from uh, mom and dad or from another entity or from uh, a divorce proceeding. This would be a way for you to verify by countering with the 22EF and having the um, agent check box number two and then having this be part of the contract. So that is one way, an advanced way of using the 22EF. Most of the time what we see is you guys using the 22EF when it is a cash buyer. And then I would highly recommend you use this because most of the top brokerages, they're, yes, they're providing proof of funds. So they're, in essence, number two is always checked and they're providing a copy of a bank statement of the non-contingent funds. 
and they may have put on their one day just to make sure that they have a day to get any kind of updates that are ne necessary for the listing agent. But they also check box number three. So I wanted to talk with Stephen about this because if you're a cash buyer, we have lost, we lost a three and a half million dollar sale and it was a very sad day for me because I um, didn't understand, didn't have an opportunity to review the contract before it was put in front of a Windermere uh, listing agent. We represent the buyer. This box was checked. Um, I'm sorry, the box was not checked. And if it was checked, what that would have given that listing agent, there was proof of funds. It was definitely a cash. So box two was checked and there was a proof of funds that was given. It was um, a Chinese buyer that was coming in from overseas and they just did not feel comfortable moving forward with the funds, the non-contingent funds, the bank statement that they saw because it was from a different country. And what I found out after we lost the deal was the other buyer was also Chinese that we lost out to, and they had checked box number three, and they had indicated in the other box that it was coming from Hong Kong Bank, and then they had indicated on line 29, if you could highlight that, Shannon, they had indicated that they would provide evidence to the seller prior to closing that that money from Hong Kong that they relied upon would be available to the buyer and to escrow. They put in there three days prior to closing. And that was the difference. That was it. We had two Chinese buyers that were going up for a three and a half million dollar sale and we did not win the offer. And it actually, our offer was $5,000 better than the other one we just did not make the seller feel comfortable because of line number 29. And many of you mistakenly leave that blank, and I would highly recommend that you don't do that, especially with a cash buyer, because what this means is that three days, in the example I just gave, three days prior to closing, the funds from Hong Kong Bank had to be into escrow so that they, the seller could verify those funds, making sure that it was ready to close in a timely manner. If the buyer failed to do that, then the seller could terminate. Seller will give notice terminating the agreement and they could use the backup offer. So we could have been in backup position and that would be the only way that the seller would have been able to go with our offer over the other one, which was unfortunate um, because of the way we structured this offer. So you do have to read and not make that mistake on line 29. Some people have put 10 days and that's, oh shoot, and then they get notice of termination. There's nothing I can do because there was no performance by your buyer to make sure that the funds that you relied upon are indeed in escrow. Um, and then they can go with the backup offer and unfortunately you guys are kicked out of the, out of, out of the picture. So I love 22 EF and you do have to understand it if you are working with cash buyers specifically in the higher price points or dealing with um, different monies coming from different places around the world. This is a great form and has netted us some, a lot of opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise without that knowledge. Let's go to 22K, Shan. Uh, 22K is the utilities addendum and I would say 95% of the time it is not filled out and it needs to be filled out and you better have your transaction coordinator do it for you or um, you can simply write in the, pug the water sewer garbage and electric and gas, what happens if you include 22K on your addenda line on the first page and it is part and it is blank, at least escrow has been alerted that there is a 22K and that they are going to be, be wanting to do something. The problem is, is that there are some escrow companies and I hate to pick on a certain company, but there are companies outside of the typical, I would say the, the big ones, some of the outlying areas, Mason County I've had trouble with, where, the, yeah, they put the 22K in, but you guys didn't fill it in. And so Mason County, I'm just picking on them today because they're the one that comes to mind with an incident I had, um, they failed to contact to verify whether the utility had been paid off. And so there was an unpaid utility due. So then it's a more of a hassle. And it's like, well, who is supposed to do it? And they will always go back to the agent because we had a duty in the contract to fill it in. So you ask yourself, is it my job or is it the listing agent's job? In the contract on 22K, it basically puts you and the listing broker responsible for inserting this information into the contract. So you guys got to work together. Good agents will work together and they will actually text each other, hey, can you let me know what the water, sewer, and garbage is? Or 
Um, could, would you mind putting that 22k together and get that off to escrow, um, or get it to the you, you know get it to your transaction coordinator? Agents will work together, and it's not really specified who is responsible. I love it when the agents, listing agents, will actually put this in the supplements. Um, all filled out, all initialed, all filled in. I love it when listing agents do that. If you're that type of listing agent, kudos to you for making buyer's agent's job easier. Um, it's also nice because then it's if I'm showing a property and I see that in the supplements, then we can also get more information about the type of utility company and how much the dues, you know, or how much roughly garbage is. Or knowing those companies is super helpful. So that's all I'll say about 22K. 22T, so I can wrap up with 22T because I'm running short on time. Um, but the title contingency is something you've got to be very careful with. The way this is written here on this example, it is best in the buyers. If you are not in a multiple offer situation, this is filled out correctly. You know, five days and you basically have the ability to get a contingency above and beyond, say, a quick ins inspection contingency of one day. This is a five-day contingency, and title contingencies often have a lot on them. Uh, there's been very few times where a title contingency has been what I would consider clear, where you don't have the opportunity to disapprove and back out of the deal. Most of the title contingencies or the t preliminary commitments that I review, they have some way for a buyer to terminate. So this is an automatic, pretty much five-day contingency period. I'd say 90% of the time I've seen preliminary commitments with a way to terminate, and there's nothing that the seller can do. Um, it's a clean and easy way to get out. So if you're in a multiple offer situation, you're going to want to look at this and think about it. And I would say you may have to go ahead and write mutual acceptance um, or not include it potentially if you are already reviewing the preliminary commitment that the listing agent pr um, provided as a disclosure. Now they would have had to have put it as a supplement and you would have had to have your buyer review it just like the Form 17 in order for me to be comfortable of you guys not using a 22T. But if you are doing a 22T and there is no supplement uploaded and you're not in a multiple offer situation, this is filled out correctly. But if you are using an inspection contingency and you got a five or 10 day inspection contingency, there's no reason why um, you can't use the inspection contingency to terminate. This would be a redundancy or an additional way for a buyer to terminate. So watch this because the way this is filled out, what could potentially happen is I could get mutual acceptance. This has happened before and it's happened to me before. Um, the buyer throws a title contingency on a 22T. They go ahead and cut their timeline down the inspection to one day. They keep the five days from the date the receipt of the buyers get the preliminary commitment. And then on day five, maybe day seven or day eight of the contract, you get a notice and they've given you a notice to remove the green utility um, thing that's on the corner of the property. And so they say they want to terminate unless you're able to remove the, 20, the, green, you know, the green little box that's on the property that the utility company has placed. There's no way the seller can remove that. That is something that runs with the property. And the seller cannot satisfy it. So what that means is this, the buyer gets their earnest money back and you go back on the market and the buyer can terminate. And so they have that right with the 22T. There is supplemental title reports that come and these are things that, you know, the seller has to provide marketable title. Number three is just a reminder that already is part of the contract that they have to provide title and a title policy that's, this doesn't mean that they are not going to provide a title policy if you don't use 22T. This is just a contingency, a way for a buyer to terminate if there's something on the title that the buyer does not like. And um, this is, a lot of agents don't understand what 22T is or how to use a 22T. You know, you have the option on line six or line eight to determine what kind of contingency you want. If you want to run it right with mutual acceptance, so the timeline's pretty simple, you could check that box rather than the other box, and then you're just going to have to work with escrow and title to get a copy of, of the most up-to-date preliminary commitment. Um, and then the seller has to, um, has, to, has to provide that as well. So if you're a listing agent and you have a 22T, you may want to, just in my instance where I had a buyer terminate on something stupid, 
you may want to go ahead and provide that to them and you know send them just like you do form 17 if they don't put it as a supplement you may want to go ahead and provide them with the title report so that they have proof and you have proof that you delivered it to the buyer's agent if this like it's filled in like it is right here that's from the date the buyers receive it um, you need to have proof of delivery and and that might not be easily proven with the way some of these title and escrow companies work. So be very careful on this and how it's done. And depending on what title and escrow company you're using, you may need to counter this point or make the buyer aware of it. I think that's it, Shannon. We talked about most of the items. I think the only one I didn't get through tonight was um, the 22J, which we can cover at a later time. So I hope, you, hope this was helpful for you in knowing what to do and what the check boxes mean in practical ways. Um, Shannon, it looks like there was a few people that chatted. Was there some other things I needed to cover? Um, no questions um, other than ones I was able to answer, but um, I do think it's worth a mention that the reason that we ask for the title report um, is for that protection um, in yeah. the event that you use a 22T. Um, we've been able to get some or people out of some some hot water so yeah or there's um, a challenge on what was provided to the buyer or what was you know what our agents did to collect information because we're collecting that we have avoided quite a bit of complaints over the over the last few years actually I think we when Jerry Kay um, joined us back in August that was a year or two ago anyway she joined us and she's like we should be collecting this stuff because we would be able to really get through a lot of the complaints and the buyers complaining that their agent didn't get them this or the seller didn't get them that um, by collecting that or asking you guys for that we have it available so that we can give it to a pr prospective complaint um, and it often alleviates a lot of questions so we're not trying to track down the title and escrow company and then they're sending us something that was never sent to the agent we clearly had it if if, if we asked you for it um, and so that's why we asked for it and um, it served us well, and we've avoided quite a few complaints just in a year alone, um, with the tw you know, with the title report being one of the required documents. Right. Um, I know we had uh, one more question. It was just, I guess, a little confusion. So just to clarify, okay. that the Alta policy versus the standard. So technically, Alta would be the standard, and then standard would be substandard. <laughs> Yeah, I th the easiest way, I'm kind of big on, it was a hard change because we were used to back in the day of checking a box, whether we wanted the, you know, Ulta or whether we wanted the extended. And they made that change to make it Ulta the, the normal policy, or I would say the A+. Plus. Uh, a stands for Ulta, A stands for A+. Plus. We want the A+, plus coverage. And then, yes, I liked Shannon's kind of alliteration with this S being substandard. Think of it that way, that it's a downgrade. So you want to downgrade or do you want to upgrade? And that's what the check boxes are for. Great, um, great call. We, Jerry Kay gets this question all the time too, and I just wanted to make sure it was reiterated. Um, even if I have a vacant land property, I should still use a 22D, correct? Yes, yes, definitely. Because of section one and actually section two, um, they have the opportunity sometimes that they're developing that they can actually put some coverage on um, it depends on the type of land, I mean, but usually that Alta policy doesn't run with the land. It depends on if it's buildable and there's structures on it. Um, it's just it's better to just have it for Section One alone. If Number One is the only thing that's checked on the 22D, that is sufficient. If you want to do vacant land and you're like, I don't want to have two pages, and you want to be that fussy, then take the language from the 22D and put that into your purchase and sale agreement or onto an addendum, but I want to have some protection on the lot size. I don't want to think it's an acre and it's actually a 0.75 of an acre because of something that was recorded improperly. So yeah, watch that. That's, that's a sticky point. And that's why we asked for the 22D always to be on vacant land, condos, um, pretty much everything, multifamily. That 22D has, has served us very, very well. Right. So one more, I guess, just to reiterate as well. Um, so as a listing agent, we should always be asking for a 22 EF if it is a cash transaction. Is oh, right? I would. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, 22 EF, that's protection. If you read that section, um, if it's a cash deal, 
there is no contingency. So let's just play it out and let's just say that the funds were coming in from it's a 30-day close and you don't, you know, have the funds, then you know, we're we're out of contract, but then we're like, can we put it back on the market? Do we technically are we still in contract? Do we do an extension? It becomes very, very messy and they just want a clean, easy break where it instructs escrow that, hey, they didn't get the funds to escrow and we want to terminate and we have the right to terminate and we can go with that backup offer or that other offer, we want to put it back on the market. Um, it's just an easier way to handle those types of situations. So I had a, okay. one more question for the 22D. So is that where I would disclose um, two different things? If I was um, a licensed real estate broker purchasing a property and if I was related yes. to that buyer? Yes, that would be in the other section and it just plainly needs to say, um, and if you want this language, I'm happy to type it for you even in a text. Um, Buyer is a licensed real estate broker in the state of Washington. That is what is necessary that the, that the auditor is looking for. And then if it's related, and then we're not talking about like, you know, oh, they were married, they were not. If it's just plainly a blood relation, let's say Shannon and I were buying a house together, um, we would say uh, buyers are related, you know, or I'm sorry, you are selling your house, buyers related to seller something like that. You would want some sort of, anything that's blood related, you'd want to disclose that relationship. Um, or like say your husband is buying, but he's the only one on the contract and you're representing him. Um, buyer is related to selling broker was, was what you would write in that scenario. So anytime you have a question about disclosure or how you should do it so that the auditor likes it and you don't have any problems down the road, just shoot me a quick text or Jerry K and we can advise you on how to write that. And that would go in the 22D other section. That is the best place for it. Okay. Did I cover them all? That is all we got. Okay. We'll see you guys next week. I apologize for not having my video camera. I actually did my hair today. So <laughs> that's too bad. And I didn't have as crazy of a Monday, but we'll catch you next Monday and we'll see if we can get the video camera to work. Um, and the visuals were very nice. Thank you, Shannon, for taking care of that for us. Have a great week, you guys.